Space Analogs, and an anonymous safety reporting program. Emily's work aims to ensure astronaut well-being and advanced space exploration. So, Emily, over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, so I'm so excited, thank you. Um, I'm so excited to talk about this with all of you guys because it's something I've been really thinking about for a very long time. Um, and I kind of I kind of introduced this concept last year at the Hall Astronaut Conference um, informally, but um, I'm really excited to actually kind of get to put that into practice um, and introduce it to you guys uh, as a community. So we're going to talk about safety and analog missions. Um, so Quick overview, we're going to talk a little bit about the safety culture of analog missions and kind of where we're at right now. Um, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a fundamental background on some elements that I've incorporated into the thought process and the structure of this program. Um, and then also introduce you guys to the program, which is the Confidential Safety Reporting Program. Um, we'll talk about the practical applications, program deliverables, a lot of the measurables that we look at with contributing factors, and then um, I'll show how you guys can help support this program with the initiative, and if you guys have any questions at the end, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, okay, so current safety culture in analog missions. So as you guys know, analog missions are becoming really popular, um, right? For whatever reason, there's um, everybody has their own underlying motivations for wanting to do these. They're fun, they're exciting, they're exhilarating, there's a lot of research opportunities in this, and with space exploration, um, a lot of people are seeing this as kind of a stepping stone um, to going into space or even as a training opportunity to prepare them for space exploration. Um, and one of, the, uh, one of the biggest things that I've kind of found and learned is um, there's, there's not a lot of opportunities for us to really learn um, from lessons that happen in habitats to create the safety culture. Um, and so that's kind of the, the basis or the foundation of what we're going to talk about. So how do we embrace this safety culture? Um, so it's really important that we are going to need to really establish a robust safety culture, especially if we want this to be sustainable, um, if we're wanting to professionalize it. We really need to show the world about this industry and that we are really taking it seriously. Um, and it's not just Space Camp, as Jenny talked about earlier. Um, she mentioned that I've also gotten the same feedback before, after doing an analog mission, like, oh, how's Space Camp? Um, and so there's really a lot to this. Um, so one of the objectives of this is not to just look at each habitat individually, um, because I know that every single habitat does their own due diligence, um, and not everybody does it the same way, um, but how can the community learn from the industry as a whole? So it's not just habitat to habitat, it's across the industry as a whole. Um, there's, of course, there's challenges and risks that we all know about during the missions, um, and the biggest ones are really in the human error, the human factors, and then um, also the system failures. So um, when we talk about establishing a safety culture, we're talking about what mission success looks like and um, also the crew safety and well-being. Um, and when we talk about mission success, it's really, um, it's not about was the, you know, did the research go as planned, because we all know that not everything goes according to plan, right? Um, but we just want to know that everybody did leave the habitat, um, all body parts intact, um, their physical, their mental, and their emotional well-being is in the same place, if not better, um, and really get them to have that great experience when they come out of the mission. Um, I know that I've spoken to a few analog astronauts, and um, they have said, you know, I will never do another mission again. It was an awful experience for whatever reason that is. Um, and so I really want people to have a great experience with this because their story affects our impact and it affects how we as an industry be able to move forward. Um, so we have to give them the opportunity to have that great experience. Um, and luckily we're going to be moving in the right direction with the standards and guidelines. Um, and so this initiative is kind of that next step uh, to take it to the next level. So there's three things I'm going to talk about here before we get into the program itself. Um, and the first one is the five elements of safety culture. Um, is anybody familiar with um, the Swiss cheese model? No, okay. So yeah, so it's like the concept of the layers of cheese where the holes line up, that's where all of your catastrophic failures happen. Um, a lot of people were introduced to it around COVID and wearing masks and stuff like that. Um, and so Dr. James Reason, he actually uh, came up with this concept based on previous research um, and he identified in his book, Human Error in 1990, 
um, the five elements of safety culture, which has been taken on by many different industries, um, including aviation, uh, NASA is taking this on as well, um, healthcare, all those kind of um, major environments. So when we talk about a safety culture, um, the first thing is an informed culture. So the community needs to be informed about potential risks. They need to be informed about lessons learned. Um, and then we also need to have a reporting culture. So we can't learn from those lessons unless they are reported. And I don't want to say reporting because, reporting is such, it carries this bad stigma sometimes because it's like, oh, you know, report you or report this. Um, but ultimately what we do, what we're doing is we are reporting a story that happened that the industry can learn from as a whole um, in order to create this safer environment and the safety culture that we really strive for. Um, and so the third one is learning culture. And again, we can't do that if we're not reporting anything that's going on um, and we're not aware of those things because in order to learn, um, we have to be able to observe what has happened. Um, and I always, I'll show the story just really quick. I'm the oldest of three siblings and I that's definitely test my boundaries. <laughs> um, and my brother and sister never got in trouble. And I was like, why? What is happening? And of course, it's like they, they saw me and they're like, we learned from your mistakes and we just either didn't get caught or we just didn't do it. Um, and so taking that idea, you know, and, and really being able to learn from um, the mistakes that happen because we are all human and we all do make mistakes. Who has never made a mistake here? If you raise your hand and make you leave the room. Yes. <laughs>
make mistakes and being able to admit to those mistakes, right? So um, essentially it is um, a process of analyzing incidents without assigning blame, focusing on identifying root causes and contributing factors to prevent recurrences. So when we look at blameless postmortem, it's really important for us to do this um, by uncovering any systemic issues, especially with the human factors. Um, and the human factors, when I talk about human factors, it's really about the human's interaction with its environment, okay? Um, and then focusing on those contributing factors and the root cause really helps us um, target those interventions, um, preventing you know, recurrences and showing where we can create accountability and where we can actually make improvements for that. Okay, um, <laughs> so taking a cue from aviation. Um, so one thing I did not mention in my bio is I have 10, over 10 years of experience as an aircraft accident investigator. Um, so I have seen my share, <laughs> I have seen my share of things gone wrong. Um, and primary, my primary um, role in all of these are looking at the human factors and recovering what went wrong and also what went right, okay? Um, that's a really big, important factor with all of this is we don't wanna just look at what went wrong. We wanna look at where, where were we really able to um, strengthen the system and what caused it to be a near miss instead of a serious incident, you know, because that's ultimately what we would want. Um, so this is an accident that I actually played a role in. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the Kobe Bryant accident that happened um, back in 2020. Yeah. Um, so um, ultimately the findings from this accident was the lack of safety management systems that were in place for the company that chartered this whole um, and so, I'm not going to read through all of this, but basically the, um, the FAA, the, with the reporting system that they had in place, they were able to identify recommendations, lessons learned, and stuff like that. Okay, so let me introduce to you guys now the Confidential Safety Reporting Program. So, this program is essentially a blameless postmortem. It's designed for the sole purpose of improving safety in analog missions, okay? Um, the purpose is to, we want to foster transparency and accountability in analog missions. Um, it provides a confidential platform for reporting incidents and near misses. Um, there could be situations where maybe a crew member doesn't feel completely confident in reporting this to maybe the habitat specifically or maybe the researchers or the organization that sent them there. So they need an opportunity or a place that they can actually submit this to an organization that's able to um, take the, that information into account and uh, be able to compile lessons learned, and I'll kind of show you a little bit of how we can, um, how we plan to disseminate that information here in just a minute. Um, and then it also encourages a blameless postmortem approach um, to be able to learn from these mistakes. So the benefits are, first and foremost, creating and promoting a culture of safety and open communication. Um, it enables early identification of all of the risks and implementation of corrective measures, and then it creates a unified effort across the analog habitats to really prioritize safety. Um, and so I said this kind of earlier at the beginning of the presentation, we're not looking at it from, you know, just one habitat or habitat to habitat. We want to be able to look at it, what, identify the trends that are happening across the analog habitats across the world. Um, where can we really strengthen and improve our industry? Um, and then obviously enhancing the overall safety and success of uh, analog missions. So the process of um, the confidential safety reporting program, anytime there's an event, this is when an individual either experiences or observes an event that is defined, um, and I have some definitions here later on my site, if you guys want to read those, but um, if it's defined as an incident or accident or near miss, um, then that's when they would, um, it, when it affects crew performance um, and safety, that's when they would report. Um, the next step would be actually reporting. So reporting, this is when the event is reported by at least one person that was involved in the incident. Um, we've kind of been beta testing this program and I've gotten a lot of questions of you know, how many or who does the report. Um, ideally, as many people who witnessed it or experienced it as possible can report that. That, that would give us more data, more information and um, our ability to really be able to see different perspectives and the true contributing factors to this. Um, especially if there's an injury, if you have a medical officer, especially having a medical officer um, submit their narrative or their report as well would be important. 
Um, and then also we want to try to do that as soon as possible because as you know, as time goes on, we start to um, forget some of the details, but doing it as soon as possible really helps us um, be able to gather as much of the facts as accurately as possible. Um, so then the next thing it does is once, you know, what happens to your information when it's reported, um, the submission is reviewed for con contributing factors. So it goes to our internal team, um, and I think I forgot to mention this, all of this is conducted by our team, which I'll introduce you to at the end of the slide, um, in collaboration with the International Guidelines and Secrets for Space Analogs, um, and it's hosted by our Shell Performance Lab, so we kind of take on that role for everyone um, to help support the guidelines and standards. Um, so our internal team will review all of the information. Um, when the event is reported, the individuals do submit their contact information. Um, when they submit their contact information, they understand that this information is used only for the purpose of being able to collect any kind of additional information that we might need to understand the full root cause of the incident um, or the accident and any kind of follow-up that we might need to make. Um, once we go through the, the review process and identifying the contributing factors, um, depending on the severity of the incident, we will do a surface level root cause analysis, um, or we'll do we'll go into a full full scope um, accident investigation root cause analysis. Once that is done, um, we then go through a de-identification process. So all the identifying information, um, names, gender, anything that might identify someone or um, something specific about you know research or anything that is identifiable, um, we remove or we generalize. Um, so I'm going to actually show you guys an example of a report here in just a minute. Um, so we do remove all of the identified information. Once that identifying information is removed, all of the reporters get an automated email indicating that their information has been removed. And then it's published. So that might sound scary, <laughs> but this is the reason why we're doing this, right? We need to collect lessons learned. We want to have transparency across the industry and we want to make improvements. So, um, there's a few different ways that we plan to kind of publish and disseminate this information, which I think is in this next slide. Um, well, okay, so first, what it is and what it's not, just a quick summary. Um, provides a safety platform for reporting incidents, encourages learning from mistakes without blame, aims to enhance safety culture and mission success, and complement existing protocols. That's important. Um, what it is not, it's not meant to damage the reputation of habitats. Um, blame or punish individuals for errors or mistakes. It's not meant to replace any kind of existing safety protocol, and it's not meant to chastise any crew member. Okay, so when to submit a form. So there's two different ways that a form can be submitted. Um, essentially, uh, any time, well, so your, your habitat can potentially be enrolled in the program, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that for anyone who's interested. That's something that we're still kind of in the works of developing. Um, but if you're happy, you're doing an incident enrolled in the program, um, then you would be required to submit any kind of incident or event reporting form. Um, and then habitats are enrolled in that program, um, they actually get to receive specific reports and recommendations and implementation strategies to actually enhance and improve their specific facility. Um, the second way is you're an individual, you did an analog mission, you observed or experienced something in the past or just recently, um, and you guys can submit those as well. Okay, so here's an example report. Um, we were so excited to be able to work with High Seas on a lot of things, um, and uh, they have been so amazing. Um, we were able to provide some of our crews with some training. They were so gracious and important in providing us the opportunity to collect information, so they were really kind of the first ones who were kind of taking this initiative towards safety in this aspect. Um, so we're really grateful for that. So I'm going to go through the elements of this specific report um, and its practical applications. And you'll notice that um, all the identifying information has been removed from this. Um, so uh, the event type is just whether it's an incident, an accident, or a near miss. Um, the next thing is the situation. So we kind of observe, was this equipment damage? Was it a personal injury or illness? It could have been just... Um, uh, I forgot the two other factors. Um, anyways, they're, they're in the form, whenever you guys take a look at it, I'll show you. Um, and then uh, the next one is the phase of the mission. So was this before the mission, during the mission, or after the mission? The role of the individual that it, um, it impacted or experienced this specific situation. Um, and then the habitat as well. 
So then we have the crew size. Um, so this is really cool because once I get to some of the deliverables, you're able to look at how can we use this as a community to say, what are all the incidents that have these specific contributing factors? What are all the lessons learned that we can find that had a crew of four people? Um, you know, those kinds of things. Um, what activity was this? So there's, I believe there's five different categories of activities. So um, whether it was research, uh, lifestyle activities, um, and this specific one was lifestyle activities. Um, if there was injuries, and I need to rephrase some of these wordings because if you can get injuries, it, it should also be illness because I think that's what this one was. Um, mission duration, so how long the actual mission was. And then what's really cool is the event day. So what I love about that factor is that we're able to look at when are these issues most prominent? At what phase of the mission? Was it the beginning of the mission? Was it in the, in the middle of the mission? Um, and then these contributing factors are kind of what we, as our internal team, were able to identify and review as what kind of contributed to this specific case. Um, the narratives, um, I think this one was um, specifically um, someone was having a, a challenge getting adjusted to maybe like the climate change or the air weather was dry or something like that. Um, so very, very minor. Um, and so we had two narratives from that one we were able to remove the information from there. Um, our identifying information, um, they also reported the actions that they took. Like we asked that specific question so that they can kind of do a self-awareness check and say what actions were taken on themselves to actually um, you know, mitigate any additional effects of that. And then mission impact. So this one's really important because this will allow us to see in the future how do these specific contributing factors contribute to the impact of the mission and what is the severity. Um, okay, so the program deliverables, and Jenny let me know if I'm really low on time, I'm so sorry. Um, so program deliverables, um, we plan to do a quarterly newsletter where we kind of share with everyone some most recent findings that we found across uh, with all of the forms that, we, that have been submitted. Um, and we've taken the same concept from uh, the NASA's uh, Anonymous Safety Reporting Program, actually, that they use in the aviation industry. It's the exact same concept for kind of replicating that structure. Um, and one of our advisors is actually someone who has worked on that team before who's been helping with us with this process. Um, so we have quarterly newsletters and then an annual publication that would be primarily disseminated um, to anyone who wants to have access to that, but I think it's most interesting for Habitat directors specifically. Um, we can look at maybe the top 10 lessons learned, um, and the majority of the, um, the contributing human factors, and any kind of recommendations and implementation plans across the industry as a whole that we should really um, take into account. Um, a searchable database for you guys. So there's two, there's two things that we can benefit from the searchable database. So as I mentioned, um, or I guess actually three. So the first one is gonna be um, you guys being aware of anything that you guys might need to do to prepare yourselves for an animal mission um, or prepare a crew coming into your habitat. Um, also, for research purposes, anybody who wants to use specific data in terms of contributing human factors to lessons learned um, is able to, as I mentioned earlier, go through and say, what are all the contributing factors for communication, coordination, and planning with a crew of six people? Um, and you can even you can narrow it down to a specific day, a specific like, time frame, mission duration or something like that. Um, and then the last one is the industry recommendation. So our hope is that all of this information that we receive is able to support what we're doing with the international guidelines and standards, we're able to continuously make improvements um, for those guidelines because we're flexible, right? That was the fifth, uh, fifth culture of safety. Um, so this is just a quick list of some of the contributing factors. I don't know if you guys can read these very well. Um, these are just some of the contributing factors that we that are measured during our root cause analysis um, that we're really able to look at. Um, these are other industries that are using the framework that we utilize for this concept and um, the reporting system. So NASA uses it, um, the FAA uses it. Um, these are all US based. Um, I did do a ton of research and put a lot of people on here because there are actually a ton of um, organizations that do this. I do have a list of organizations um, all across the world that do a confidential reporting system just like this, um, but it's primarily for healthcare and aviation. Um, uh, so our team, so Madison Diamond, she is one of our human factor specialists, and then Dr. Scott Chappelle, um, he is the 
professor and chair at Human Factors at Andrew Little. Um, and he's the one who has been really a key player in a lot of this, helping us um, making sure that we're taking the proper steps and procedures, especially understanding the ethic and ethical implications of this um, and the confidentiality. Um, he's the one who's worked with NASA quite a bit in getting their, their reporting system up and going. And then myself, I look more into the, um, the investigative aspect and root cause analysis for this. Um, so the way that you guys can help support this is we really want to release our next publication, our first publication, um, quarterly newsletter. We want to start that in the fall this year. Um, and in order to do that, we need events. So um, if you guys scan this QR code, it takes you to a link where I have a few links on there, but um, there's one where you guys can submit a form. You guys can take a look, look through the form and see the questions that are asked. Um, and then if you guys have any questions about the form later on, I'm here all weekend. Um, I'm happy to talk about it. And I'm also open to receiving any kind of feedback. I mean, we have a room full or a conference full of people with different backgrounds and experiences and expertise. So um, I'm only one person. Um, in my team, we have three right now who are specifically working on this project. Um, but anybody who's open to volunteering or supporting or getting feedback in this process uh, would be greatly appreciated. So thank you guys so much. itself is damaged or an animal or a plant, would that be reportable? It would be, yeah. Um, and that would be something that we can look into why was why did that happen um, and kind of trace it back to that. And I guarantee you that if something like that happened, it it may be the first, but I guarantee you it wouldn't be the last. This damaging things that aren't people could potentially harm people still. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> How are you training people before they go into an analog mission for which events are going to be something that's reportable? Like, what is that kind of structure around creating a safe environment and having that standard actually be set so it's not just we're doing this piece at this station and then here and other? Um, so, that's a really good question. So, one of the really cool things that we got to do with high C is training work for the crews actually the mission. Um, so, we did a little bit of training, but then we also did some training on the actual forms itself um, so that we can have consistency across the board. So, um, we get to work with the crew specifically, and then um, I had mentioned we have to have a million on the program as well, so we do a little bit of an onboarding process with that too, um, so that we're able to have that consistency. Does that answer your question? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Okay, we can talk more later. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I think you're shocked. Um, so, I'm curious, like, when I did the analog at high seas, we were doing our mission reports every single day, and there is such a backlog of information in those reports. Like, is there any way to get past analog missions to sign off and give you access to those to pull from? Because that, it sounds like right now you're just going to be starting with the tracking process. Mm -hmm. Are, is there any ideas of how to take what's already been? Made. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what it comes down to is like the bandwidth and the resources that we have for people to actually thumb through all of those because I know that there's so much information out there. Um, and so this is kind of helping us support like not having to do that in the future. But right now, I think what we're primarily relying on, um, I think right now especially, we're relying on people to um, send in information on past experiences that, that they've had. Um, but I think that would be a really great opportunity, be a missed opportunity if we didn't use some of those events that happened. It's just a matter of getting together the human resources to be able to put something like that together. Yeah. I just had a quick comment on that. For MDRS, we've actually published all of our crew reports going back all the way to Crew One. They're not in an easy to research format yet, but we are working on that. We have some volunteers working on that. That's awesome. And you can, anyone can go. Look at all the that have ever been. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I've kind of looked at some of those, and kind of what you were mentioning, Rochelle, is you know, going through those and identifying you know, the factors and submitting those reports. Um, we want to be consistent about the questions that we're asking in order to create consistency across the habitats. Um, but I love that NRS does do those reports and they are public access for people to be able to do. This kind of brings in that added user friendly element to it um, so that people able to um, easily see the information and look at the data and stuff like that. Did you have a question?
question. Yeah, just quick to comment. So, also, um, because for the Austrian Space Forum, we have we don't have a reporting team, but we have lessons learned that each team sort of keeps a log of. So, the animal nationals keep one, the medical team keeps one, so then we have a discussion within each team about how we're improving the make the next mission. I wondered if you thought that might be good idea. I'm not sure all animal habitats do that, but I wondered if, uh, if that lessons learned could be good. Mm -hmm. I kind of a slightly softer way to report you other than if I didn't say it before. Or like yeah. minor issues that come up. I think so. I think I think that's a really good point to make. Um, I know that report is like such a harsh word, and so looking at lessons learned, I think is really you know playing with the psychology of the words and stuff is good. Yeah, thank you. I think you might get Okay, I'll be here all week. So. <laughs> <laughs>